Today we're going to be discussing a general overview of the anatomy, some kinesiology, and biomechanics that surround the knee. Before we dive into the material, just a reminder that this material is to be used for educational purposes only and does fall under fair use consideration. The references for today come from these sources, uh, Mike Riemann's Orthopedic Clinical Examination, uh, Newman and Oatis for much of the kinesiology information, Dutton and McGee to complement some of the orthopedic considerations, Moore and Daly's Clinically Oriented Anatomy, and then finally Josh Cleland's Netter's Orthopedic Clinical Examination. As a general introduction for the knee, recognize that we are joining two long lever arms which consist of the distal tibia and the more proximal femur. As such, because of these lever arms and because of the large amount of force that is subjected to and, and in and around the knee, uh, this is a joint that is highly susceptible to injury and therefore highly relies and is dependent upon the static restraint of ligaments as well as the dynamic restraints of the muscles. So as we begin our discussion of the knee anatomy, we'll start with the tibiofemoral joint. It is the largest joint in the body. Uh, we consider this to be a modified hinge joint with two degrees of freedom. We have two condyles on the femur, both medial and lateral, and an intercondylar notch that exists which allows for the proximal attachment of the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament that are found within the notch. Additionally, we also find the posterior meniscofemoral ligament uh, within this location as well. The tibia consists of two plateaus that is separated by the intercondylar eminence where we find the distal attachment of the ACL and PCL. The tibial plateaus are concave while the femur is convex, which is a concept that will contribute to our understanding of the biomechanics of the knee with both open and closed chain knee flexion and extension as well as a mechanism known as the screw home mechanism. Considering these plateaus, the medial plateau does have a greater surface area than the lateral plateau, and it is also three times thicker. Uh, this accounts for the increased forces that we see displaced through the medial compartment. And finally, the concavity of the plateaus is increased by the menisci. Much like we see in other joints of the body, the fibrocartilage serves to deepen and enhance the congruency between the convex femoral condyles and the more concave tibial plateaus. This also helps to dissipate force, to attenuate shock, and overall increase kind of the static uh, stability of this joint. If we look from now a lateral cross section, we can start to appreciate some of the various anatomical structures in and around the joint. Uh, specifically, we can appreciate the synovial membranes. The lateral meniscus is visualized on this cross section. We can appreciate where the patella sits in its more proximal location in a knee extension uh, position. We'll talk about how the patella will glide inferior as the knee flexes. Additionally, we can see the suprapatellar fat body or fat pad, as well as the infrapatellar fat pad. Additionally, this allows us to visualize some of the synovial space uh, and the compartment being found within the intraarticular space. It's also a nice visualization of the articular cartilage that exists at the end of the long bones. And note then that with the articular cartilage in place, there really is not a uh, an instance of bone-on-bone -bone contact. Uh, most notably, uh, this is important within the patellofemoral joint, which we'll discuss momentarily. Interestingly enough, uh, Scott and Chris Dye, along with Jeff uh, Voppel, uh, completed a study um, in the late 90s, uh, 1998, where uh, they went in and performed conscious neurosensory mapping of the internal structures of the human knee. And so they used a local uh, anesthetic, but then did not use anesthesia. And while they were probing with a blunt object, uh, the internal structures of the human knee, they rated it on a zero to four Likert scale. Zero being there really was no sensation. Um, they were not aware of it, all the way to four being severe pain. And these are shaded in various colors uh, with the graphic above. 
what's interesting with this is one of the most highly um, uh, pain inducing or um, uh, uncomfortable uh, structures within the knee was the infrapatellar fat pad and this has great implication when we begin to consider uh, the pathophysiology of patellofemoral pain syndrome um, the pathophysiology of also known as jumper's knee um, and and overarchingly anterior knee pain from the most broad sense and so it oftentimes uh, may be implicated that being the infrapatellar fat pad but we do not see as much of a uh, anatomical um, uh, contribution uh, from some of the surrounding structures and so in these scenarios it oftentimes is a process of desensitizing um, and mitigating load and tolerance to that load for the patient As we look at another uh, view, this would be of the knee in a flexed posture um, on a on a uh, fixed or stable distal tibia. We can begin to appreciate not only the surface area of the distal femoral condyles, but also uh, height and uh, angular orientation. But first, let's talk about kind of the resting position of the joint. It is approximately 25 degrees of flexion. Uh, some sources will note that the resting position lies somewhere between 30 to 60 degrees of flexion. Uh, once you move either beyond that into flexion or extension, capsular ligaments and other structures do begin to uh, increase more or less uh, the amount of congruency between the joint surfaces. And so you will begin to move into a closed pack position. The capsular pattern is flexion followed by extension. Uh, when we look at the lateral condyle, then it is in line with the femoral shaft. The anterior surface does bulge further forward, and the reason for that is to provide a static restraint to the patella. The medial condyle does have more vertical height from a superior to inferior orientation, and the anterior surface does not bulge forward, and so it is a shorter surface than that lateral condyle. And so if we look then at this image, you can begin to appreciate there's a slight angulation variation from 10 degrees on the lateral side to 25 degrees on the medial side, but there is a 10 degree uh, change in terms of the prominence of that lateral uh, femoral condyle. And again, that lateral femoral condyle has that increased height and anterior bulge to provide a static restraint to the patella. As we now begin to consider the muscles of the knee, the big muscle on the anterior portion of the femur is our quadriceps, which consists of our vastus lateralis, intermedius uh, medialis, otherwise known as the VMO, and then rectus femoris. As we look at the hamstring group, here we find the semimembranosus and, some, and semitendinosus, as well as the biceps femoris, consisting of both a long head and a short head. The gastrocnemius is part of the knee as it is a two joint muscle with the lateral and medial heads inserting proximal to the tibiofemoral joint. The popliteus is also implicated here as well as our hip adductors on the more medial side um, and then finally the TFL acting through the distal insertion of the ITB on the lateral side of the knee. As we look at these images from uh, netters, we can begin to appreciate both the lateral and the medial view. Several things to take note of are where some of these muscles uh, and tendons and ligaments are inserting. For example, here we can see the iliotibial tract crossing the knee joint and inserting uh, just lateral and proximal uh, to the tibial tuberosity. We can appreciate the orientation of the biceps femoris, both long head and short head on this lateral view, as well as the vastus lateralis. Additionally, you can begin to appreciate some of the uh, subtendon bursa uh, that would exist for both the biceps femoris, um, as well as um, the bursa that lies deep to the distal iliotibial tract. On the medial view, we can appreciate the vastus medialis uh, blending in with some of the retinacular fibers. Uh, we can also see the medial patellar retinaculum as well as appreciate a little bit of the infrapatellar fat pad. Additionally, we can note the insertion of the sartorius, uh, the gracilis, as well as the semitendinosus. Um, all three of those will come down and insert uh, on the pes and serene. And then we also get a nice visualization of the medial gastroc as well as the uh, soleus lying deep to that. 
In this image, we see the lateral side uh, yet again, but with a, a slightly different uh, orientation because we're a little bit into then the posterior portion. So we can see and visualize the lateral collateral ligament as well as the arcuate uh, popliteal ligament. Um, here we can visualize the plantaris muscle that's been cut and reflected back, uh, as well as the lateral subtendinous bursa, the gastroc muscle. Additionally, one of the things that's nice about this uh, image is we can visualize the tibia and, excuse me, the fibula and where the common uh, peroneal or fibular nerve uh, begins to come uh, down and wrap around that uh, fibular head. As we move into the posterior compartment of the knee, this would be uh, where we would find the popliteal fossa. Uh, this would be a posterior view of the right knee. What's nice about this is we can now start to visualize a lot of the static restraints. So most notably, we can visualize the capsule uh, of the knee, as well as some of the tendons uh, and insertions and origins of various muscles. Most notably, we can visualize the tibial and fibular collateral ligaments, also referenced as the medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament. We can also now see the more proximal insertion, uh, or excuse me, origin of both the medial and lateral heads of the gastrocnemius. And we can visualize on the lateral side our um, uh, long head of biceps femoris tendon, um, as well as um, the bursa that lies directly beneath it. Note some of our reinforcements um, to the joint capsule. Uh, our anterior reinforcements will be our quadriceps as well as the retinacular fibers, uh, the patellar ligament uh, as well as the patella. If we move to the medial reinforcements, uh, the MCL uh, would uh, assist uh, in terms of uh, protecting the joint capsule. Note that the MCL is contiguous uh, with the joint capsule due to its uh, attachment to the medial uh, meniscus. On the lateral side, uh, one of our main uh, reinforcements here is the popliteus muscle, which is why the LCL is not a capsular ligament um, because of this orientation. And then posteriorly, we have the oblique popliteal ligament, the arcuate ligament that we saw earlier, semimembranosus tendon, as well as our anterior and posterior meniscofemoral ligaments, and then finally the fascia of the popliteus muscle. So there's a lot of restraints to the posterior knee. Here we can visualize the components of the quadriceps femoris complex, and this is a really important complex in and around the knee. What's nice with this image is you can appreciate both medial and lateral retinacular fibers, but you can also appreciate line of pull. The vastus lateralis obliquus pulls at approximately 38 to 48 degrees, the vastus medialis 50 to 55 degrees, and then you have your vastus medialis longus, vastus lateralis, rectus femoris, and vastus intermedius. Additionally, uh, in figure 1233 from McGee's sixth edition, you can visualize the movement of the knee showing not only the, tri uh, the quadriceps, but also the hamstrings, which serve kind of as a tripod. And so in this uh, image, one would illustrate the patellar tendon, uh, which is the distal uh, attachment for the quadriceps. Two would be the iliotibial band in that more uh, anterior lateral orientation. Three would be biceps femoris. Four gastrocnemius, five semitendinosus, six semimembranosus, and then seven and eight would be gracilis and sartorius, and so you kind of have that grouping there on the pes anserine uh, distal insertion. Table 12.4 also comes from McGee's sixth edition and provides a helpful overview of the actions, the nerve supply, and the nerve root uh, derivations uh, for the muscles acting uh, at the knee. We have the primary flexors of the knee uh, existing in the posterior tract. We have the extensor of the knee, which is our quadriceps, uh, as well as the tensor fascia lata, and we'll talk about that momentarily uh, as it transitions from an extensor moment to a flexor moment as we get beyond 30 degrees of knee flexion. We also have medial rotation of a flex leg in a non-weight bearing position as well as lateral rotation of the flex leg. Um, note that the main uh, three nerves that are supplying uh, innervation are the sciatic nerve, the tibial nerve, and then the femoral nerve. There are components of obturator, superior gluteal, 
that we also see, um, but the main three divisions would be tibial, femoral, and sciatic. Here we can visualize the femoral nerve as well as uh, the variation of the saphenous, um, as well as, as we look into the posterior tract, the sciatic nerve, um, beginning with the divisions of L4 and 5 and extending to S1, 2, and 3. Additionally, we can visualize the decusation that occurs just proximal to the popliteal fossa, where the sciatic nerve branches into the common uh, fibular, or also referred to as peroneal nerve, as well as the tibial nerve. The tibial nerve is going to continue uh, to progress further uh, and will innervate and, and provide branches into uh, the sural nerve, as well as the medial sural cutaneous nerve. This is a helpful visualization for um, the peripheral neuro uh, or sensory distribution uh, in and around the knee. Um, with this, again, you can visualize the femoral nerve divisions L2, 3, and 4, uh, as well as the distal then saphenous nerve, um, and then also the infrapatellar branch of the saphenous nerve. On the middle portion of your screen, you see the similar image that we just saw, which illustrates the posterior tract of the sciatic nerve. But now we can begin to appreciate uh, the uh, peripheral nerve uh, distribution. And so here we see uh, the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh, and then our uh, lateral sural cutaneous nerve from the sciatic nerve, as well as uh, divisions of our sural and tibial uh, nerves uh, branching down. Finally, uh, on the far uh, right-hand portion of your screen, you can see the individual uh, mapping of each of these uh, peripheral sensory distributions. If we come back now to the joint surfaces themselves, we've already discussed the femoral orientation, um, both between the medial and the lateral condyle, uh, that anterior bulge or that slightly higher uh, orientation of the lateral condyle to prevent uh, more of a lateral tracking of the patella. Um, but we also need to discuss the shape. So here we find a concave uh, structure uh, more superiorly uh, when we're looking at the tibial plateau. We have more of a flat uh, inferior surface and then more rounded outer edges. And it's those rounded outer edges that really help uh, to improve, again, the congruency and concavity of the area. The insertion of the menisci helps to then distribute the force. And so these act as a static shock absorber. Uh, the menisci are directly attached to the popliteus as well as the semimembranosus. Uh, the outer third receives blood supply from the capsule, so therefore there is a direct supply. The movements of the menisci are going to follow those of the femoral condyle. So even though the anterior and posterior horns have tight, uh, very statically stable uh, restraints, uh, the menisci movement is more going to be produced by deformation of the fibrocartilage. If we go back to that outer third uh, receiving blood supply for a moment, um, there's some debate if it's 25% to 30%. Uh, it's probably closer to 25% for the lateral meniscus and then probably an, a third for the medial meniscus. Um, and so with this, because of the vascularization, there is a potential for healing. Uh, the remaining inner portions are considered avascular, meaning there's not a blood supply um, that, is, that is there. Despite that lack of vascularity to the inner portions, the menisci may still heal though. Um, so we need, to be, we need to be mindful of that. Uh, additionally, we find the transverse genicular ligament, which serves as a link between the lateral and the medial meniscus. If we look at um, kind of the composition of these, the lateral uh, is a complete circle almost. Um, it's smaller, it's thinner, it's more mobile than the medial side. The periphery attaches to the tibia, the capsule, and the coronary ligament, but there is no attachment to the lateral collateral ligament. Remember, only the medial collateral ligament has a direct attachment to the meniscus. Uh, and so we have also two meniscofemoral ligaments that attach to the lateral meniscus. Uh, the first being the ligament of Humphrey, otherwise known as the anterior meniscofemoral ligament. The second is the ligament of Ristberg, which is the posterior meniscofemoral ligament. If we then move to the medial side, uh, this is more of a U-shaped meniscus. Some uh, individuals have referred to it as having more the appearance of an elephant ear. Uh, 
Uh, it is attached to the anterior and posterior tibial plateau by the coronary ligaments. And as we've said before, it serves to deepen the portion of that medial tibial plateau, increasing congruency. The transverse genicular ligament does serve as a link again between these two compartments. And so overall then, if we had to kind of um, provide a general overview of what the menisci do, first and foremost, they're composed of fibrocartilage. That is really important because fibrocartilage is very good at dissipating force. However, it is susceptible to injury. It improves the articular congruency between the distal femur and the proximal tibia. And it's going to help to uh, attenuate the force that is incurred at the knee and distribute weight. Uh, because of this large surface area of the tibial plateau, that weight distribution is done uh, very, very nicely. Additionally, it will help to improve synovial fluid distribution. Because of the inner uh, two-thirds of the meniscus being avascular, that distribution of synovial fluid is really important for the overall health of the joint. And then finally, it will help to prevent capsular entrapment and impingement due to that improvement in joint congruency. Next, we move to our cruciate ligaments. These get a lot of attention, and um, we're only going to be providing a general overview today. Um, I would encourage, uh, if you are interested in learning more about the ACL and the PCL, uh, to definitely uh, review the sources that I cited at the very beginning, um, because this is just a general overview. We could spend uh, multiple hours talking about these two, these two ligaments alone. Uh, so let's start first with the ACL, also known as the anterior cruciate ligament. Uh, it lies uh, more in that anterior portion. Uh, it checks the anterior translation or gliding of the tibia on the femur, as well as controlling for internal rotation of the tibia on the femur. It is taut, or it will tighten, on extension and or hyperextension, and it is considered an intraarticular ligament. The PCL is the posterior cruciate ligament. It checks uh, or, or prevents posterior gliding of the tibia on the femur, and some fibers remain tight throughout the entire range of motion of the knee. If you're thinking about how the orientation of these look, consider crossing your second and third digit. Uh, that is essentially how the, the presentation would look with your middle finger or third digit uh, illustrating the ACL, and your second illustrating the PCO. Uh, also, we should note that there is a blood supply uh, for these ligaments from the middle and inferior uh, geniculate branches of the popliteal artery, as well as an innervation by the posterior articular nerve, which is a branch of the posterior tibial nerve. It therefore contains mechanoreceptors uh, and the ligaments have a proprioceptive function. The reason that's important to mention is after a rupture of the ACL, uh, which would be discussed uh, through differential diagnosis in a, a pathophysiology review, uh, this loss of mechanoreceptors and proprioceptive function is thought to have a significant effect on the knee. Uh, and there are several researchers both within uh, the world of, of ACL rehab, but also within uh, the realm of neuroplasticity that are con uh, considerably more knowledgeable on this, and I would encourage you to, to look at their research. Uh, some of those individuals would be uh, Lynn Snyder-Mackler, uh, Dustin Grooms, um, uh, uh, Chris Powers, um, Terry Grindstaff, and, and others. Let's talk about the ACL uh, for a moment because it is um, a structure of the knee that gets considerable attention. Uh, the ACL absorbs approximately 90% of forces that cause anterior translation, and so it's a really, really crucial structure uh, within the knee. The anterior medial and posterior lateral uh, bundles or fibers are, are, are varied in terms of where they are taut. The anterior medial bundle is taut in flexion, uh, and the posterior lateral fibers are more taut in an extended position. Uh, fibers are unyielding and stress greater than 5% of its resting length may result in a rupture, okay? And so uh, these are fibers that, while they restrict and absorb the force, uh, they are susceptible to injury because they do not yield, okay? The highest load on the ACL occurs uh, with quadricep use from approximately 40 degrees, uh, maybe as little as 30 degrees of flexion to full extension. What's the implication of this? Well, we're going to talk about that because this has implications for open kinetic chain activity at the knee, specifically following an ACL reconstruction when it's imperative that we protect uh, the reconstructed graft.
Hyperextension of the knee also results in higher loads on the ACL, as well as excessive internal tibial rotation and excessive varus and valgus stress. So if we think of, of how the mechanism of injury typically plays out for the ACL, it typically is valgus in excess, excessive internal tibial rotation, and either excessive hyperextension or flexion of the knee. And when you combine all three of those together, you're really beginning to wring out uh, this ligament and creating a high degree of susceptibility. And that's what you see illustrated here in the graphic to the right. Arguably one of the most well-known uh, professional athletes who has been very, very susceptible uh, to injury of the ACL is RG3. Um, this is an interesting side-by-side uh, -side comparison of him uh, performing a jump where uh, he is demonstrating quite a high degree of dynamic knee valgus. And one of the predictors, or we should maybe say estimators uh, for ACL injury, is this high degree of dynamic knee valgus because what it is, is correlated with it are those other two positions that really kind of create uh, a high propensity for injury. We don't want to say predict um, just because there are so many different factors uh, that do go into play uh, for injury to occur. Instead, estimating, meaning the risk is, is, is increasing, is probably a better uh, term here. If we consider the PCL now, um, it is 50% thicker and twice the tensile strength of the ACL. It's been suggested that this is one of the reasons why we do not see as many PCL injuries as we see with the ACL. Uh, with that said, there also are uh, the positions uh, where it is taught and mechanisms of injury uh, that lead to a decrease in the number of injuries to this to this ligament. The anterior lateral bundle is more taut with flexion of the knee, um, and, and then the posterior medial bundle taut with more extension. But again, keep in mind, some of those fibers of the PCL will be taut throughout all of knee range of motion. It provides a restraint for posterior translation of the tibia on the femur. It's most loaded when a posterior force is applied to the tibia when the knee is flexed to approximately 90 degrees. And so this is where we see a concept known as the dashboard injury, where a significant amount of force um, would be needed to tear the PCL, and it typically results from trauma. And so. Um, Dashboard injury uh, means that you would be sitting in the front seat of a car, your knee is flexed to 90 degrees. Unfortunately, you would be involved in a motor vehicle accident and the dashboard would come into contact with the more proximal portion of your tibia and would cause a posterior glide of the tibia on the distal femur. That would cause uh, an increased force to be um, applied to the posterior cruciate ligament, uh, which is already loaded in that 90 degrees of flexion. But motor vehicle accidents are not the only mechanisms of injury. You can also see this in uh, contact sports, um, tackling in, in football or in rugby or other sports, where again, um, that proximal tibia would, would be stopped essentially, but the rest of the body would continue to move, uh, perhaps in deflection. Um, that could also create a mechanism of injury that would result in a tear. When we look at the tibial femoral joint biomechanics, we recognize that again, the femur is convex, the tibial pl plateau is more concave. We noted earlier that it's a modified hinge joint uh, with primary uh, two degrees of freedom, but really six degrees of freedom once we recognize that there is rotation about the sagittal, transverse, and coronal axes. Um, but really, we, we, we think of it as being more modified hinge joint at two degrees of freedom. Stability, again, is provided by the soft tissue, which we've already reviewed. Um, there is little inherent stability of the joint without that soft tissue. Right? So we have to have the static restraints of the capsule, the ligament, the menisci, as well as the dynamic restraints of the quads, hamstrings, and triceps sura. A secondary stability uh, due to the muscle is not near as effective as your intact ligamentous stability, which is why oftentimes we see individuals have the ACL reconstructed or have meniscal uh, arthroscopic surgery performed in order to, again, enhance and, and provide that stability. While we're speaking of static stabilizers, we also need to talk about the medial and lateral collateral ligaments, also known as the uh, 
uh, tibial and fibular collateral ligaments. The medial MCL is an extraarticular ligament, develops as a thickening of the medial joint capsule, and so it is uh, continuous with the uh, joint capsule through the, the medial meniscus. The superficial band is thick and flat. Uh, the deep band is a continuation then of the capsule and blends with the meniscus, and it protects against the valgus force. The lateral or fibular collateral ligament arises from the lateral femoral condyle and inserts into the head of the fibula. It's very cord-like and remains free of the joint capsule and the lateral meniscus. It resists more of a varus and particularly from approximately 25 degrees of flexion into full extension. The joint mechanics of the tibiofemoral joint um, are rolling, gliding, as well as rotation. The movements occur simultaneously uh, to maintain joint congruency throughout the range of motion. As we consider knee flexion, the femur rolls posterior and will glide anterior. During knee extension, the femur rolls anterior and glides posterior. And the last five degrees of extension rotation also does occur, and this is what is known as the screw home mechanism. This exists because of the geometry of the menisci, the tension of the surrounding static ligamentous structures, as well as action of muscle. So consider a line of pull. If we consider the tibia to be fixed, uh, the screw home mechanism occurs with medial rotation of the femur on a stable tibia. What's the norm for range of motion about the knee? Uh, recognize that patient specific factors will vary this. Um, for example, we'll talk about in and out of a bath. The structure of the bath also varies. Is this an older bath that has a higher tub wall? Uh, is this a shower? Is this one of the newer baths that actually has a door where you can step into? Obviously that would de demand a very different range of motion. So these are these are, these are ranges um, and, and averages, uh, so take them with a grain of salt. For gait during the stance phase, you need approximately 20 degrees of knee flexion, give or take. For swing phase, you need approximately 60 degrees. So functional for gait, you really need less than 90. For stairs, uh, if we're considering a reciprocal pattern of gait, 90 to 100 degrees of flexion is needed. For sitting and rising from a chair, we do have to consider chair height, right? Uh, for a standard chair, approximately 90 degrees, but if a lower seat height is present, that may increase up to 110 or even 120 degrees. Again, in and out of a bath, highly dependent upon what our definition of bath is here, but could be as high as 130 degrees or as low as 110, maybe even as low as 90. And then to perform a full deep squat, uh, this would be essentially bringing the glutes all the way to the heels, um, kind of that squat position that we think of with infants or toddlers. You need quite a bit, 150 to 160 degrees of range of motion. Next, we're going to talk about the patellofemoral joint. It's a modified plane joint. Uh, we have a lateral articular surface of the patella that's a little bit wider. Uh, it does contain the thickest layer of cartilage in the body. There is just a ton of fiber cartilage on the back of the patella. Interestingly enough, when I have watched uh, orthopedic uh, surgery, uh, most notably total knee arthroplasty, um, the, the posterior portion of the patella typically looks quite good even if uh, the articular cartilage of the medial and lateral compartments of the knee is more deformed and degenerative. Uh, and so um, the patellofemoral joint actually maintains a fair amount of, of uh, cartilaginous uh, protection. It's considered a sesamoid bone, and its purpose is really to provide the articulation uh, with uh, the tibiofemoral joint to protect the distal femur and protect the quad, and then finally to improve the moment arm of the quad. It acts as a pulley, and we'll see that um, momentarily. It has seven facets. There's an odd facet on the on the more lateral side, and then um, we have three medial facets and, and three lateral facets. The patellofemoral joint improves the efficiency of extension, and this is what I mean when I say it acts as a pulley. Uh, it specifically um, helps with the last 30 degrees of knee extension by transmitting forces across the knee, uh, thereby increasing the moment from the axis. 
and it also will decrease then the friction, our coefficient of friction uh, for the quadriceps mechanism. And so uh, if we look at this with some functional activities like walking, uh, walking is about 0.3 times body weight, but if we go into climbing stairs, descending stairs, or squatting, in essence what is occurring is we are increasing um, the, the line of pull and thereby increasing the load through the patellofemoral joint. If we look at the location of contact, we talked about this earlier, that depending upon where we are within the knee range of motion, the patella will glide either more proximal or more distal. The location of contact at full extension uh, is really not in contact with the femur at all. It's actually resting on the supratrochlear fat pad uh, in a more proximal orientation. As the knee begins to flex from approximately 10 degrees upwards of 90 degrees, the contact area is going to shift from a distal to the proximal pole of the patella, meaning it's going to the patella itself will glide more inferior. Once we get beyond 90 degrees, it rides down into what we would refer to as the intercondylar notch. And by approximately 135 degrees, the odd facet makes contact with the medial femoral condyle. Now, what should be noted is within that 10 to 90 degrees is where uh, the patella has uh, in essence the most medial lateral uh, freedom to move because as you get beyond 90 degrees it glides into that intercondylar notch and is actually quite stable. This illustration gives a nice um, uh, visualization of joint forces and line of pull uh, for what we just talked about with some of our functional tasks. A partial squat, uh, you can appreciate uh, the pull from the quad tendon and the patellar uh, ligament or patellar tendon um, is varied compared to a deeper squat here. Um, but it should also be noted that there is no bone to bone contact with the femur in full knee extension, standing, walking on level ground. The contact between the femur and the patella will vary and it's referred to better as patellar compression than, than contact or bone to bone contact. And it's gonna depend on what we just talked about. The angle of knee flexion, are we beyond 90 degrees, less than 90 degrees, where we're making that contact, the surface area, and then the overall patellofemoral joint reaction force. Tracking and plica can be an issue. Um, the plica is a remnant of embryologic synovial folds. It's normally present within the joint, but it can become thickened and even inflamed and thereby will restrict uh, joint play. In addition, it can kind of alter uh, or result in an aberrant path of descent to the patella as the knee moves from more of an extended position to a flex position. And it can be implicated then in several patellofemoral pain syndrome. The most problematic of the, of the plica is the medial plica. Uh, it can scar down and create more laterally directed force of the patella. And if this occurs, and if there's, there's, there's a pathologic uh, component to it, meaning symptoms are present, um, it can either be stretched or arthroscopically uh, clipped or, or removed. The third joint we have to talk about is the proximal tibiofibular joint. Uh, this is located below the tibial plateau on the lateral condyle of the tibia. It's an oval tibial facet on a slightly concave fibular head. The joint does receive support from anterior and posterior ligaments uh, as well as an interosseous membrane. The proximal tibial fibular joint really has no motion, um, or excuse me, has more motion than the distal tibial fibular joint. So when we're considering uh, the, the tibiofibular joints, um, where we're going to find our motion is more proximal. It can glide both superior, inferior, and anterior, posterior, but it follows kind of a rectilinear path, meaning it's non-linear in just an anterior, posterior uh, direction. And so it's going to be, it's going to be um, more of an anterolateral and posterior medial uh, direction. The lateral collateral ligament does attach onto the head of the fibula. So now that we've discussed the three joints of the knee, uh, one of the other things that's helpful to recognize is how some of our various axes can vary based on uh, the position of the knee, both statically and dynamically. This is a helpful graphic because it shows our anatomic and mechanical axis, uh, both the femur, the tibia, as well as then the mechanical axis of the limb. So specifically uh, note the red line uh, in image A, this would be kind of the normal orientation uh, 
of the, the lower limb. Um, there is a degree of angulation here that's known as the Q angle, um, but it, it, it relatively lines up for the mechanical axis of the femur and the mechanical axis of the tibia. And so we, we, we see those two axes correlating very well with the mechanical axis. In image B, this would be an example of dynamic knee valgus, where now the mechanical axis falls outside, more lateral, to our mechanical axis for the femur and the tibia. This is thought to increase then that lateral tracking of the patellofemoral joint. It's also thought to predispose the ACL to increase forces as well as the meniscus and increase the force uh, or stretch on the medial collateral ligament. If we look to finally image C, now that mechanical axis falls medial, and so this would be an example of a more varus uh, position of the lower limb, genuvarum. This also uh, illustrates a similar uh, notation. Uh, keep in mind we discussed Q angle previously. Uh, one of the big differences between males and females is the degree of Q angle, and the Q angle is the angle of pull um, of the quadriceps, and it's not aligned with respect to the patellar tendon. Uh, so that's again the Q angle. As the quadriceps straightens uh, during concentric contraction, the patella will be pulled laterally from the sulcus. That lateral force of the quadriceps is also amplified by the iliotibial band and the lateral patellar retinaculum. The patella tracking is improved overall by that lateral lip of the femoral condyle, uh, the fibers of the VMO, as well as the medial patellar retinacular fibers. Now it should be noted if we go back to that uh, slide from McGee that showed the various uh, innervations and supplies uh, to the various muscles, the quadriceps as a whole gains its innervation from the femoral nerve. And one of the things that we recognize here is it's an all or none uh, situation, meaning when polarization depolarization occurs, the nerve will cause the quadriceps to fire, but it's an all or none situation. We cannot preferentially bias the vastus medialis. And so when we're discussing then patellofemoral pain syndrome uh, and, and tracking of the patella, we need to look elsewhere than trying to bias or preferentially strengthen uh, the VMO. Here we see our uh, forces, um, both lateral and medial. Uh, you can begin to uh, appreciate what's known as the bowstring force on the patella. This is what we've we just discussed, but it helps to give kind of that graphical illustration why we do see more of a, um, a correlation of that lateral tracking of the patella. Now we can appreciate the biomechanics of the knee, both in open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain. Uh, for open kinetic chain flexion and extension, uh, we have posterior roll, anterior roll, and then the glide and slide. Uh, for closed kinetic chain, it's just um, the opposite uh, with regards to the glide. You still get anterior and posterior roll, but now you get an anterior glide of the femur on the tibia and a posterior glide of the femur on the tibia. So our reference changes from the tibia to the femur due to the, the, the distal segment being fixed or closed. Uh, during closed kinetic chain, it should be noted, compressive forces minimize shear, and that's a good thing, okay? During open kinetic chain extension, shear force goes up. So the research suggests that an increase in stress on the ACL with open kinetic chain, specifically from approximately 25 to 30 degrees, uh, does exist. But the anterior shear does not increase with resistance in closed kinetic chain as much as it does in open kinetic chain. So the clinical takeaway here is we need to avoid open kinetic chain at terminal knee extension in those early phases of ACL rehabilitation when we're trying to protect the new ACL graft. When we consider Q angle, um, one of the things that should be noted is how we would actually make that measurement. Um, it's formed uh, from a line that's drawn from the ASIS to the center of the patella and then down um, uh, to the center uh, of the tibial tubercle. The angles measure uh, for a tendency of the patella again to move laterally uh, and we would expect that the Q angle increases with knee extension not knee flexion. Finally to kind of pull everything together you can appreciate um, how uh, uh, alignment uh, has a very very um, kind of interdependency between different joints and regions. Uh, the width of the pelvis, uh, muscular development more or less, uh, increased flexibility 
instability, uh, things like hyperextension or genuvalgum and varum. Uh, the degree of the, the femoral notch, is there a more narrow femoral notch, a more wider femoral notch, uh, the excess of Q angle and even excess of lateral force, the degree of tibial torsion, lateral uh, versus more medial, as well as the foot in pronation and supination. Uh, the benefit of this slide is now you can really begin to appreciate how the lower kinematic uh, chain has an influence really all the way from the pelvis down to the ground. And so as we wrap up our review of the anatomy, uh, kinesiology and biomechanics of the knee, we need to appreciate that what we talked about at the very beginning, which is these two long lever arms between the femur and the tibia, uh, really rings true. If we are to do a, a proper assessment and take into consideration these, these various anatomical features, we also must consider the joints above and below the hip, and the foot in terms of our clinical examination. So uh, hopefully this has helped to increase your uh, awareness, uh, serve as a review, and uh, connect some dots. So thank you for watching and have a good day.